All right, welcome to, uh, let's wake everybody up there. Welcome to uh, the Muzzling the Scientists panel for Media Democracy Day. Uh, my name is Shane Gunster. Uh, I'm a professor in the School of Communication, and it's my pleasure to moderate this panel. Uh, we have a fantastic group with us this afternoon to talk about how and why scientific information and perspectives are so often marginalized, ignored, and even excluded from public debate and discussion about uh, environmental issues. A little over four weeks ago, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, a book I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and a book that is often credited with galvanizing the modern environmental movement. And that anniversary, I think, helped to remind us of the incredibly important and essential role that science plays in raising our understanding, raising our awareness about the harmful impacts that human activities can have upon the natural environment. Impacts which are all too often invisible to most of us as we go about our daily lives. But scattered amidst the many tributes to Carson's extraordinary legacy as both a scientist and an environmentalist. I think the merging of those two was one of the things that was so inspirational about her. One could also find this rather virulent strain of anti-Carson commentary, which condemned her work as junk science. Those attacks, which are almost always ideologically motivated, recalls the fierce an often deeply personalized smear campaign which the chemical industry waged against uh, Rachel Carson in the 1960s in a desperate attempt to defend its economic and its political interests. And as Brian Walsh, science editor for Time Magazine, recently noted, quote, if Silent Spring gave birth to the modern green movement, the critical reaction to it created the blueprint for how industry would defend itself against environmentalism. Whether it's, whether it's pesticides, asbestos, or air pollution, the battle plan has been the same. Question the science, attack the scientists' credibility, and warn of unbearable costs. Now, in recent years, industry has, unfortunately, I would say, acquired a new partner in this country in their efforts to marginalize scientific research which challenges its ability to engage in business as usual. I'm speaking, of course, of our very own conservative government. From funding cuts to world-renowned research projects such as the Experimental Lakes Area, to cutting off open media access to government scientists, to reducing environmental oversight of industrial projects, the Tories have systematically sought to minimize the role that scientists and their research plays in how we engage with environmental issues. Now, we've seen a strong response to these attacks from scientists and activists, like people on our panel today, from environmental organizations, and I would say also from ordinary Canadians who are both worried and angry at the chasm that increasingly seems to separate science on the one hand from policy making on the other hand. But we can't forget that it's not just governments who have been muzzling scientists. When news organizations cut funding and space for scientific and environmental journalism, scientists are being muzzled. When extreme weather events like droughts, forest fires, hurricanes are routinely reported with no mention of their connection to climate change, scientists are being muzzled. When newspapers continue to use op-eds and columns to promote the opinions of so-called climate skeptics, scientists are being muzzled. Now, there are, to be sure, some bright spots in our Canadian media landscape. Uh, Margaret Monroe of Post Media has done some great work on this issue. Mark Hume, uh, sometimes Jeffrey Simpson in The Globe, they have important things to say, and there are others. But then one thinks of Lawrence Solomon, Rex Murphy, Margaret Wente, Michael Smith, uh, I would say the entire editorial board of the Calgary Herald, and the picture grows somewhat darker. So in this context, we've asked our, our uh, panelists today to share their thoughts with us on three important questions. One, how and why are scientists being muzzled? Two, what are the challenges involved in communicating science to the public? And most importantly, perhaps, 
what are the implications for democracy and public debate? So our format today, each speaker will have about 10 minutes. <coughs> Uh, and then I'll ask a few more specific questions of the panelists, and then we will open it up to the room for discussion uh, and um, questions. So I will just introduce each speaker as they speak. I think that probably makes the most sense. And our first speaker uh, for the day will be Sapora Berman, who uh, I'm certain is well known to most of you. She has an extensive history as an environmental activist and advocate, working on a broad range of issues with a truly impressive variety of different groups and organizations. So she was one of the co-founders and campaign director uh, for Forest Ethics. She was also a co-founder and executive director of Power Up Canada until, I think it was last year, she was the co-director of Greenpeace International's Global Climate and Energy Program. And she's currently working on a variety of campaigns around clean energy, oil sands, and pipelines. And somehow, amidst all of this, she also found the time to write a book, recently published, which is entitled This Crazy Time, Living Our Environmental Challenge, and which there are copies available, I think, at the table to my right. So, Sapora. <laughs> Thank you so much, and uh, thank you um, to uh, MDD for inviting me here. It's um, almost therapy uh, to be having the right conversation, um, even on a Saturday afternoon. I want to start um, with a story uh, that, for me, was a turning point in my work. I decided to return from working internationally to focusing on Canadian issues in part because of a conversation I had uh, with my eight-year-old this winter. We were sitting at dinner and he leaned over at me and said, Mommy, why does the government think you're a terrorist? <laughs> just, uh, just not the conversation you want to have over dinner, really, um, with your eight-year-old. And he asked me that because he had been listening to the radio while my husband was making dinner and he had heard that there was a debate on the Senate floor where several conservative senators were, were arguing to have environmentalism included in the definition of domestic terrorism in Canada. They were doing this using examples of the work of Forest Ethics, an organization I co-founded, and Greenpeace, who I was working for at the time, and Quinn had put two and two together and figured that, therefore, the government thought I was a terrorist. I raise this story because the attack on uh, charitable organizations uh, in this country this year is unprecedented. The government, while doing uh, uh, broad budget cuts this year um, that affected uh, our capacity to do uh, science in this country and also to understand what's happening on many critical issues, um, at, raised the budget of the Canadian Revenue Agency by $8 million in order to um, put uh, charities under more scrutiny because of concerns, it was said in the debate on the floor, about the potential for money laundering and foreign influence by radical extremists. What we need to understand about this is that there has been no incidences of environmental charities not observing the existing laws. This is a manufactured controversy in order to attack the organizations that threaten the government's um, agenda. So I see three ways um, that uh, are, three things that are challenges facing our capacity to communicate science to the public. One is the attack on NGOs. The other is the direct muzzling of scientists, the firing of scientists, the elimination of scientific research. And third is the replacement of that knowledge base, of that access to information with what I call peacetime propaganda. Democracy thrives in a system where there's widespread dissemination of knowledge, where we have support of rational scientific inquiry that can help us ensure we have the basic information to distinguish between good policy and bad policy, between effective and ineffective policy. Certain conditions are required in order to ensure that that knowledge is truly shared, shared to create informed debate. The most important conditions of these in a democracy are transparency, our mechanisms for public participation, resources to ensure effective participation across class and racial boundaries. 
So I want to spend a couple of minutes pulling this apart because I believe that the basic tenets of democratic process are currently threatened in Canada, creating an increasing gap between rich and poor and the development of policy based on ideology that is clearly in opposition to what the majority of the population wants. So it's said that knowledge is power, that the suppression of knowledge is the oppressor's most powerful tool. In the last several years, we've seen a dramatic suppression of knowledge in Canada, a disturbing silencing of some of this country's most important scientists. I, I really think two of the most dramatic examples of, of this are the elimination of the National Roundtable on Environment and Economy and the elimination of the Canadian Foundation for Climate and Atmospheric Science. So energy act is actually a Tory body. Many of you will remember 16 years ago it was set up under Mulroney in order to balance between environment and economy. For the last 16 years, energy has been putting out reports that look at how do we build a sustainable economy in the country. And specifically since 2006, this body has put out a report every year that has shown that it is possible for Canada to build a low carbon economy, that we can reduce global warming pollution, we can actually increase our gross domestic product. What's going to be necessary to do that? It's going to be necessary to increase costs for polluters, to make polluters pay in some way. So the, the fact is um, that uh, these reports say we need to slow down the dramatic expansion of the oil sands for environmental and economic reasons. The government didn't like that information, so it shut it down. The Canadian Foundation on Climate and Atmospheric Science was one of the most important bodies that government, governments and scientists globally look towards to show us the pace of global warming and understand how close we're getting to dangerous atmospheric levels of carbon. It was, in effect, one of our canaries in a coal mine. This is a government that would like us to forget about climate change because their current economic plan is a one-trick pony. It relies entirely on the dramatic expansion in the oil sands at the expense of many other industries. It runs contrary to any climate logic. So the government shut down the Canadian Foundation for Climate and Atmospheric Science. I could go on. You've mentioned the Experimental Lakes area. This is the research station that helped us fight acid rain three decades ago. And, does, and, and did, up until this year, research on water quality that was groundbreaking. The government shut it down. The fact is, this is a government that doesn't, doesn't believe we should protect water at the expense of industrial projects being pushed forward. One only has to look to last month, when the government removed water protection out of the Navigable Waters Act. We now protect industrial shipping routes. We protect navigation. We don't protect water. Or this spring, when they removed fish habitat protection out of the Fisheries Act. Why? Lightly, likely because those oil pipelines they so desperately want cross literally thousands of streams and wild rivers. Without these laws, these projects are no longer threatened with legal action or trigger an environmental assessment. And of course, there's also the direct firing of hundreds of scientists. Close to 400 scientists in Environment Canada have been let go. Those that stay are muzzled, not allowed to speak to the media, have watchers, handlers with them at scientific conferences. For example, last fall, Environment Canada prevented Dr. David Tarasik from speaking to journalists about his ozone layer research, work which had already been published in the journal Nature. And earlier, the Privy Council office stopped Christina Miller, a researcher at Fisheries and Oceans Canada, from granting interviews about her work findings that had already been published in the journal Science on the causes of sockeye salmon decline in British Columbia. As critical as the knowledge and legal recourse that is being taken away from us is what it's being replaced with. Multi-million dollar ad campaigns, the government's own actionplan.ca, which talks about world-class fines, which talks about world-class laws, which talks about new technologies to protect the environment while we harvest our resources. The fact is there are no fines for companies. There are very little fines for companies that don't obey laws. And it's an easy promise since there are so few laws left. They talk about better technology, the fact that more, t more pipelines mean jobs. They talk about cleaner oil sands. 
But more important than just the government's campaign is the fact that the right has create, created an echo chamber in Canada because these ads resonate with the same messages that you'll see with the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers ads. Oil sands today, it actually, I think I have time for one last story. I, my, my, the same son, Quinn, is quite precocious. Um, it, uh, also at dinner one night, I was actually just returning from the United Nations climate change negotiations in South Africa, so I'd been gone two weeks. And we were at dinner at our local Chinese restaurant, and um, he turned to me and said, Mommy, there's good news while you were gone. And I said, great, Quinn, what's the good news? And he said, didn't you hear? They fixed the oil sands. It's all better. <laughs> so I had to spit my green tea across the table at my husband, and, <laughs> and, I, and I said, what, what, Quinny, what do you mean? And he said, oh, I see it on TV. Clearly, my husband had been resorting to TV. I was gone two weeks. And, and he, he said, no, 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 I, I see it on TV all the time. They figured out how to do it. They pat the earth back down, and all the trees have come back, even the butterflies, he said to me. So there are two obvious problems here. One is that they're lying. Um, the, the first is, you know, just take a look at some of the examples in these ads. We have, we're able to reclaim the land. In fact, recently we heard the industry announce that they're going to make lakes for recreation out of the toxic sludge ponds. So what do we have so far? In terms of actual successful reclamation in the oil sands, we have 0.1% reclaimed. The toughest laws in the world, we actually allow the industry to monitor itself. There are no limits in the oil sands for the most dangerous toxins. The most toxic uh, chemicals that are coming out as a result of oil sands extraction are naphthenic acids. We have no limits to naphthenic acids in Alberta. In fact, we asked the industry to monitor itself. And recently, when Environmental Defense asked Environment Canada why we have no limits for these very dangerous ke chemicals, Environment Canada responded, well, we don't know how much is being put into the environment since we don't monitor it, so we can't put a limit. We are currently pumping out 300 million liters of toxic water a day into open pits that now spread 170 square kilometers in the center of Canada. You can see them from space. This is the single, most, the single largest and most destructive industrial project on Earth. And however, we now have a multi-million dollar ad campaign telling us it's all better, that the industry can mitigate the impacts of the oil sands and we shouldn't really even be debating it. The larger debate we need to be having in Canada is about whether or not heavy investment in the oil sands expansion is how we want to build our economy. The government does not want us to have that conversation. Public participation is also critical to a healthy democracy, yet the public no longer has standing in public processes related to the expansion of our oil economy after Bill C-38. Unless you live directly on the pipeline route, you can no longer engage in the public participation processes. And by the way, climate is not allowed to be heard or discussed in any of the pipeline hearings. The government has been attacking charities that traditionally have played an important role in providing information to the public, helping to level the playing field, engage those on the margins. They've now included environmentalism in domestic terrorism, Many leading environmental groups are now being audited and threatened with their charitable status. And I've had conversations with several of those organizations that work on this issue where they've said, these issues where they've said, we can't really speak out now on what we want the government to do or the concerns we have about the existing laws because it wouldn't be charitable and we're under audit. That's what they want. This despite the fact that the majority of Canadians believe in climate change, the polls show the majority of Canadians want clean energy, the majority of Canadians are concerned about the impacts of oil sands, trust and value environmental organizations as sources of information. Let's be clear, close to 70% of this country didn't vote for the Conservatives, but now they have a majority and they are systematically eliminating the voices that can provide us with balanced information, the capacity to advocate, the science to make informed decisions, all in the name of big oil. That's why this gathering is so important. The most important thing we can do is inform ourselves and get organized. We need to keep these issues alive. 
We need to build the conversation in Canada that they are trying to silence and then amplify the information because democracy does thrive on knowledge, diversity, and engagement. The voices of experts are being silenced. The infrastructure of those that would engage diverse voices and advocate for alternative pathways is being challenged. And ultimately, in Canada, our policy is being decided in the oil patch instead of in Ottawa. But the good news, and I'll end here, is that we have the technology, the creativity, the capacity to build the Canada we want. We also have the ability to make sure that the conversations the Harper government are intending to destroy thrive. When I started campaigning on environmental issues, there was no internet. My first cell phone was the size of a brick. It required its own briefcase. Good organizing was about how many people you could get around your kitchen table. Today we have the capacity to connect with thousands in seconds, but this will likely only have the impact it needs if it's married with the grunt work of social change, real list building, real world activities, door knocking and organizing. Ultimately, engaging more and more people in key constituencies is the most important thing that we can do to counter the attack on science, democracy and our environment. Thank you. Thanks, Sapporo. That was a great way to start uh, this panel conversation. And certainly, if you're looking for optimism, I think the uh, efforts that you and others have been engaged in with respect to Northern Gateway is an inspiring uh, example in terms of when we get people involved, when you build that awareness, real, uh, real impacts. Uh, you can have a real impact, which I think you and others are in terms of changing that debate and hopefully changing the outcome of that process. So thank you for that as well. Uh, our second speaker uh, for today is Emma Pullman. She is a researcher, writer and campaigner focused on climate and energy, the politics of oil and corporate, uh, corporate accountability. Uh, she's worked with a variety of organizations, including uh, serving as a campaigner for someofus.org. And she is director of research for leadnow.ca, which Personally, I think is one of the most exciting uh, examples of political activism we have in this country um, today. She's also a freelance writer, and her work has appeared in a variety of venues, including the Smog Blog, the Huffington Post, and the Vancouver Observer. Emma. Hi everybody, I'm just putting a timer on so I don't talk for too long. Um, sorry, I just have to get my talk going. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for the introduction. It's an honor to be here today. It's an honor to be invited to speak at Media Democracy Day. I'm a big fan and I've been um, coming to Media Democracy Day since I moved to Vancouver uh, a few years ago. Um, First, I'd like to acknowledge the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Musqueam traditional territory that we're on right now. Um, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I know about the muzzling of scientists, and I'm going to connect it more broadly to a bit of what Sapporo talked about, the public relations um, war that the Harper government is waging on environmentalists uh, to protect the tar sands. And uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the petrostate as well. Um, so. I'm a bit of an accidental activist. I never intended to get into this kind of work. A few years ago, I worked for government in Ottawa, um, and I was one of the people that wrote talking points that I'm gonna talk about, the talking points that filter through different government departments um, before they go back to a, a, a government employee or a minister to talk. Um, and a few years ago, when I'd had enough, I moved to Vancouver, and I was introduced to this amazing community of activism. Um, I started learning everything I could about global warming um, and started writing for a great website, Desmog Blog. And once I started, I couldn't turn my eyes away. I saw misinformation as far as I could see um, and from tobacco, former fac tobacco lobbyists trying to convince the public that global warming was a hoax. And I originally looked a lot at the United States and as I started looking at what was happening in Canada, I was horrified. Um, I think in some, some regards, our government 
our government is completely involved with the oil industry in a public relations battle to discredit environmentalists to protect the tar sands. Um, and a couple of years ago, I had the honor of meeting this incredible climate scientist named, named Naomi Oreskes. Um, and she wrote this totally revelatory article that appeared in Science in 2004 called Beyond the Ivory Tower, where she looked at 928 peer-reviewed articles um, in scientific journals from 1993 to 2003 with the keywords global climate change. And she wanted to see if there was any dissenting views about um, whether or not global warming was real. And she did not find a single study that disagreed with the consensus of global warming um, and greenhouse gases causing global warming. So I found that really interesting because at the same time, one of my colleagues came and put a book on my desk by Ezra Levant called um, Ethical Oil. Um, and this is around the same time that Prime Minister Harper was on global TV talking about foreign radicals um, funding the you know, taking away Canadian jobs and Joe Oliver writing an open letter to Canadians um, about, about these foreign radicals and, you know. So I think that it's really important to look at what's happening right now in Canada. And I think Sapora touched on this as a highly organized public relations campaign to protect the tar sands. Our government is deeply engaged in this campaign and this campaign is deeply organized. It is no coincidence that the Harper's, that Harper's comments and Joe Oliver's comments and websites like ourdecision.ca and Ethical Oil all speak the same talking points because it is the same group of people organizing the strategy. Um, I think that if we can, if I can have one, folks in this room leave with, with one thing on their mind, it's that it's that all of these things, the attack on charitable status, the spending $8 million in our budget to investigate charitable status, um, the labeling of opponents of the tar sands as enemies of the state, the attack on First Nations, our government's passage of omnib omnibus style bills, um, and the muzzling of scientists to tightly control the message are deeply connected. Um, so, I think that maybe someone else might talk about this, but back in 2007, um, a, mem a memo was circulated to employees at um, Environment Canada. It was called a proposed media relations protocol um, to guide the department in responding to calls from the media. Um, the rationale was one department, one website, one department, one voice. Um, it was supposed to ensure that media inquiries were responded to quickly, accurately, and consistently and was supposed to improve service to media by coordinating responses. And I'm going to give you guys some examples, but the result of this is pretty shocking. And it's actually, it has not done this at all. It has not done what it was intended to. Um, I'm going to give you an example. I was recently at PowerShift in Ottawa, and we had a scientist who was talking about what might happen if she was going to talk to the media. So she's she would get a call from, she's written a study, and she would get a call from Quirks and Quarks that said that they wanted to speak with her, great program. Um, so she would have to contact her supervisor who would send it to um, her department's comms department. Um, sometimes the comms department would ask a program expert to respond with approved lines. Um, sometimes it was referred all the way to the minister's office or the prime minister's office. Um, but say they want an interview. The comms department would ask for the questions that they wanted to ask those questions would then be reviewed by her department and bureaucrats would write approved answers to those questions and recommend that she use them. She would then be, instead of encouraged to talk to the media, she would be encouraged to submit written answers. Um, and if she was, by some stroke of luck, allowed to talk to the media or in a live interview, somebody from the government would be on the line with her listening. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Um, I think, oh, so, so first of all, Margaret Monroe, who um, Shane talked about a minute ago, um, has submitted access to information requests that show that Natural Resources Canada um, was started a strategy this spring um, where scientists were told that they needed pre-approval from um, the minister's office to speak with journalists. Um, so these rules went into force in March. Um, so 
usually it affects issues like climate change or the oil sands, or when um, somebody is talking to a national media organization like the CBC. Um, so the ludicrous thing is that a national resources NRC scientist named Scott Dallimore um, wrote a study about floods 13,000 years ago, um, and he wasn't allowed to talk to the media about it. Um, it took uh, two days for a request to the media to be filed, and ultimately the reporter for the story ended up going to the scientists in the United States who'd co-authored the study and didn't talk to the Canadian scientists because they couldn't. Um, and this is the problem when you've got a 24-hour media cycle. Um, a reporter needs to talk to you now. They don't need to talk to you in eight hours, three days, or three weeks. They need to talk to you now. Um, the second story, I think, is is incredible. So in 2010, in June, there was an earthquake in Ottawa, um, you know, a public safety issue. So buildings are shaking. The public wants to know what's going on. But for some reason, the public can't access that information because Earthquakes Canada, Earthquakes Canada the federal office that measures and reports on earthquakes, um, couldn't tell anyone. Their public phone lines went down immediately along with their website. Tom, the reporter, ended up going to university scientists um, and ultimately the US Ge Geological Survey for the information he ultimately could not access in Canada. But he submitted an access to information request and four and a half months later, 2,500 pages of emails arrived. National, national, natural resources got stuck in a bureaucratic nightmare. First, they were forbidden to talk to reporters because senior management wanted to wait, and then they were forbidden to tell reporters about a conference call that happened whose only purpose was to tell the media about the, wait, about the earthquake. 2,500 pages of emails. Can you imagine how much bureaucratic capacity, how much taxpayer dollars that, that cost? Um, and finally, another one that I think connects a lot with um, the work that I do is there was a leaked um, federal memo that shows that Peter Kent's department tried to minimize Cana Canadian media coverage of a major international um, scientific assessment report that looked at evidence linking human activity to extreme weather. Um, Environment Canada didn't want its scientists to actively talk about extreme events and disasters relating to climate change. So the comms plan that was leaked shows that officials told um, scientists to not publicly men mention the issue unless they were prompted or asked by the media. This is fundamentally problematic for the public's access to information and for democracy. Um, the Harper government shift in policy, though these all of these examples don't talk about the tar sands, um, are many, in many ways, I think, proof of the cozy relationship between our government and our oil industry. Um, not only does Harper want to control the message and the messenger in an unprecedented way that we don't usually see in liberal democracies, but he's also shutting down opponents. Um, before I leave, I just want to leave you with a concept um, that I think that we should start talking about in, in Canada more and more. Um, um, Andrew Nikoforik is one of the few Canadians who's starting to talk about this, and I think that Sapora's comments highlight it perfectly. The concept of a petrostate. A petrostate is when government dependence on income from a single staple such as bitumen or natural gas can weaken institutions, dumb down policy, concentrate power, cripple the economy, and even hinder democracy. It is literally when the interests of oil become indistinguishable from the power of the state. And I would argue that Canada is increasingly a petrostate. Um, to connect it to the concept of muzzling of scientists, petrostates are not transparent because there are so many issues about the money. Who's getting the money? Who's watching the money? And how is the money, where's the money going? Um, that information is hard to come by. Um, but they say of petrostates that over time, oil revenue can strengthen authoritarian regimes or weaken democratic ones. And the reasons are simple. Oil states or petrostates can, with petrodollars, buy consent and marginalize dissent. And as an activist and a professional activist, I want to say that the Harper government is trying to do exactly this, but it's actually having the opposite effect. Um, there are incredible people-powered movements that are building in Canada. Um, it's it's like intoxicating to be a part of right now. It's 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 crazy. There's you know there's 
so much of it's happening in British Columbia. There's groups like the Wilderness Committee, like Forest Ethics, like the Yinka Dene Alliance, um, and organizations that I'm involved with lead now and some of us. Um, it's amazing to be a part of, and I think that Harper's strategy of shutting down dissent has actually galvanized our movement and made it stronger. This week is a perfect example. We've been fighting um, a China investment deal called FIPA all week. 70,000 people have signed a petition. Um, thousands of people have written letters to the editor. Um, people have called their MPs' offices, and we've blanketed conservative writings with radio ads. This is all people-powered, and this movement is spreading, and I think it's because of that. Um, that's all I want to say. Thanks. Thanks, Emma. Uh, and again, for uh, concluding on a positive note. Uh, those are great. You don't always find that in discussions of environmental issues, so it's wonderful to have that. Uh, I'm glad you switched from the dark side, writing, uh, writing those bullet points to deconstructing them for us. Thank you for that. Uh, our third speaker today is Otto Langer, who uh, you may have recently seen in the news uh, providing some critical commentary on the findings of the Cohen Commission. Uh, Otto worked as a scientist in the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and Environment Canada for over three decades before joining the David Suzuki Foundation and working there from 2001 to 2006. He's been an expert witness in over 100 habitat and pollution trials across Canada. In 2009 and 2010, he was awarded a BC and then a national award as Conservationist of the Year. In March of this year, he exposed the Harper government's plans to gut the Fisheries Act, and he's continued to lead the fight against conservative efforts to weaken and undermine Canadian environmental legislation. Otto. I might not have a positive final comment on that. I'm sort of seen, uh, in fact, someone from DFO called me last week and they said I was a prior of DFO, that's why I'm just dressed in black today. Uh, when I was called several months ago about if I want to make a presentation at this conference, I thought, why me? And I actually thought about it for a few weeks. What do I know about media democracy and muzzling? Uh, I'm not an expert in muzzling. I always felt as though I was a victim of muzzling. However, uh, the topic was very timely. We we're in the Cohen inquiry, and I had legal standing there. But uh, 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 we were having real problems with scientists. And these weren't just DFO scientists. People like myself, ex-DFO scientists, were blocked from appearing before the Cohen Commission. And some of us took that quite hard. And so even the Cohen Commission, in some ways, was into muzzling. And maybe that's why I'm a bit of a critic of the Cohen Commission. They made a few good recommendations, but they went about it ass backwards. Uh, also, Bill C-38 was mentioned, uh, it neutered the Fisheries Act and SIA, so timing for this conference is just great actually, uh, yeah, the timing couldn't have been better. To put the issue of muzzling into context, I, I'd like to say muzzling is not a simple thing, it's not simply taking a shit disturber scientist and shoving a rag down his throat, it's much more than that, it's much more subtle than that, and watch Harper, he's going to refine it into a well-honed art. Uh, when the Cohen Commission started, they wanted data from DFO, of course. Uh, so uh, DFO, uh, and I'm getting a lot of this from John Cummings and inside sources in government, you've got to have those sources or you are muzzled. And uh, uh, DFO said, we'll give you what you need. And Cohen said, oh no, I've got the promise from uh, Prime Minister Harper that I can have whatever I want. And they, then DFO said, what do you want? And Cohen didn't know any better. He says, I want everything you have in the Fraser River and Sockeye for the last 20 years. And if you know government, you don't make a request like that. And when you ask to make an ATIP request for one small thing, and you get 2,500 pages. But if you, in a sense, ask for everything government has for 20 years, uh, you're, you're up against a bit of a task, really, to have a look at all that material. They ended up getting 570,000 documents. These aren't pages. Three million pages of documents. 98% of them from DFO. The other 2% from nobodies like myself. And... Uh, and however, the condition uh, by the government was that uh, DFO would only hand over this material, and th this isn't public information, DFO would only hand over this material if Cohen agreed to embargo it all. It had to be a, a secret in a secret bank, in a secret library, and the library was set up. It was all digitized. 
and everything was embargoed and people like myself that had legal standing, we had to sign an undertaking, take a course on how to access the information, then we had to sign an undertaking that we would not repeat what we saw to anybody and we couldn't copy it and release it, et cetera, et cetera. We were basically muzzled. And this is your information, 98% of it is taxpayer paid for information from government. And right now it's still hidden away in that library, if you could believe it or not. Uh, of the uh, uh, 570,000 documents, only 2,100 were made public because they were entered as exhibits. If they were not entered as an exhibit, Cohen would not allow anyone to see it other than uh, the lawyers and people like self, myself that had uh, uh, clearance to look at the document and signed a, a waiver to all of our rights so that we couldn't release any of this material. About $3 million was spent to assemble this material and now probably if the Cone Inquiry is over, it's probably all going to be destroyed. The public will never see it. It'll be hidden back in the libraries back in Ottawa and elsewhere. There's more than ample evidence from this inquiry that the scientists were muzzled, government staff were muzzled, the inquiry was muzzled, and the inquiry in itself muzzled people. And then, of course, when you start muzzling all these people, the media is muzzled. I mean, without information, uh, the media is actually quite useful, yeah, useless. Uh, you're not going to sell many newspapers unless you have something to put in them. I think the Cohen Commission actually took muzzling to a new high, and I feel sorry for him. I think he was trapped into it. Uh, and I, I think it's really unfortunate, and I think that reflected in the lack of impact of some of his recommendations. And I'm certain, and I have no proof of this, but I'm certain when Harper spoke to Cohen and he had several meetings with Cohen, he told Cohen, okay, you can have subpoena powers. John Cummings said you have to have subpoena powers because DFO will lie and misrepresent the truth. So make certain you spe subpoena the experts. So Harper reluctantly gave in. DFO opposed subpoena powers. They didn't want to swear, swear an oath that they were going to be truthful, I guess. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we think that really undermined the inquiry and didn't get to a lot of the truth. One of the things that could not be covered, was not covered, don't criticize DFO. So we had no evidence led on what's wrong with the organization, what's wrong with their management, what's wrong with their hiring practices, why do they have so many inept people doing the job or not doing the job. So that was a big hole in the Cohen inquiry. But let's not be naive, a little story put, helps put it in context, but let's not be naive, we've always had muzzling. I mean, ever since we had human societies, uh, probably even before we had civilized society, we probably had muzzling. It's dangerous to disagree with a bully or, or with a lar group larger than your group, really. And the Romans were good at muzzling, just ask some of the Christians back then. Henry VIII was good at muzzling people. and. Uh, the, we have to appreciate it. it's just not a scientist thing and not an environmental scientist thing. Any group with information or knowledge that can embarrass or contradict any human organization, it can be business or it can be government, uh, uh, they're going to be muzzled. It's not in the interest of that organization to adverse views that could un undermine the story that they're trying to present. I think in my 43 years in government and uh, as an in-go now or just a shit disturb, I don't know what I call myself now that I'm retired, I think the Hartford government has taken Canada to a new low, and I think he's really fine-tuned uh, what is muzzling all about and how you go about it. With, and this is where I'm being a bit repetitive, and I'll be a little bit jerky here because probably about a third of my presentation has been give, given, and that's good because we're agreeing. <laughs> but uh, with Harper, science is a real threat. Uh, Harper's more or less has said we're going to blind, blindly push jobs and prosperity agenda, and damn it. Uh, when a job comes along, there's DFO, they're going to get in the way of that job, whether you're putting in a culvert, cutting down a tree, or, or building a tar sands plant. So uh, the environment is really opposed to profit and jobs, and we've got to get them under control. It's that simple, really, and uh, whether we like it or not, that's what the bully is saying in Canada right now. Let's quickly go over the recent history of organized muzzling, and Emma did some of this already, so I'll try and skip over it quite quickly. And I think muzzling actually, Emma gave the impression that things really changed under Harper, but she did mention that some things happened under Mulroney, and I agree there, but I think some things started earlier than probably she indicated when I was in government, we had some real problems back in the 1980s. I'd say the journey of organized muzzling really began with Mulroney. And actually the media reporting forms, the MP reporting forms, those are all in place by 1985 already. I've got copies of them in my files that I smuggled out of DFO for the Cohen inquiry and kept in my garage for 10 years hoping that someday I could use them. 
Cohen didn't want to hear about that. But yeah, we, I had to do questions and answers, and you wouldn't have to just do questions and answers if the media called you. A year or two later, it's an MP call, you had to do uh, briefing notes, and if there was a big issue, you had to do questions and answers. And if you just read about something in the newspaper, you heard something, you had a controversial project, you had to do a briefing note and question and answers. The minister insisted that they had to have all information in front of him uh, when the next morning when the NDP or the Liberals or whomever asked questions in the House of Commons. An impossible task, but still, uh, the, the, that's where we're living right now. And the fax machine originally in the early, late 70s, early 80s was a dreaded machine. It was quite important. We all watched it to see where the hatchet would next fall. And thank God that the fax machine was always close to the Xerox machine so we could steal the secrets before management got them and hid them. Uh, now it's email and then we go into uh, the, the better electronic modes and some of them are great to spread material around but they're also good to, to uh, push along the muscling agenda. The MP forums and the media forums and the big project forums are especially destructive to the civil service because the question and answers were just terrible when you think about it. Me as a civil servant, I'd sit there and I'd have to come up with a series of questions. I'd have to pretend I was a nasty, dirty NDP or across the house. And how can I embarrass my minister? So I'd have to come up with all the embarrassing questions. And then I'd have to put my mind into that of the minister and come up with lines of how he's going to lie and misrepresent the house to get out of this, uh, this line of questioning. And why would a civil servant, let alone scientists, are now doing that in Nanaimo? And this came out in the Cohen inquiry. Why would you expect a civil servant to be so politicized or a scientist? But that's where we're at. And then we had the ATIPS. Oh, that looked good. It was my member of parliament in Peace River. Uh, I'm a tar sands kid from northern Alberta. And uh, ATIP looked good, but it really is information control. It's used as a tool to muzzle what the public gets right now. And its original intent was well lost, even though my old member of parliament pushed it uh, probably about 40 years ago, old Jed Baldwin. The year about 2000, uh, ATIPS was 1985, the year 2000, I remember having a debate with my boss because I couldn't defend what the government was allowing in the Yukon. They believed that you could mine in a stream and protect salmon and grayling in the in Yukon streams. And I was a sediment expert and no one would believe me then. I was actually declared persona non grata in the federal government. I was told I wasn't talking about sediment and I was always asked about it and I knew my career was coming to an end at about that time. And a director then told me, you know, you had great potential, you should have gone off to Ottawa and you could have been a director now. And he says, no, but you've got to learn that it's irrelevant whether the government makes a mistake or not, it's your job as, as a scientist to defend it. And, and that's the bottom line. I give you names, but I won't right now. I'll write it up and I'll include the names. <laughs> And then it was mentioned earlier by Ammo, 2007-2008, the Mulroney, gov uh, Harper government, Harper's a lot worse than Mulroney actually. And, and one reason why Mulroney was so, I just mentioned it to uh, uh, the, the speaker beside me, one reason why Mulroney did look quite green, uh, he had a, a environment minister called McMillan, I think from Prince Edward Island, and many of you are maybe too old or too young, I don't know, probably too young looking around the room, to remember who his executive assistant was. It was Elizabeth May. So I'm certain that had a little bit to do with the uh, Mulroney government doing a few things that looked half decent back in the, in the 80s. Now, all communications have to go through the communications branch. That's correct. And that edict uh, came around in 2007, 2008. And that's why if you look at Christy Clark's office or the Mulroney, uh, Harper's office, uh, communication branches get bigger and bigger because they are the, the, the organization that's going to determine what you can say and what you can't say and all inquiries have to go from the scientists to the bureaucrats to the communications branch goes to Ottawa. Yeah, it, you, you get a response back in three weeks uh, and that, that's a way of telling the press you get lost, you're never going to get an answer if you want to publish it by tomorrow or in a week. Uh, tough, that's your problem. And then I thought uh, we really hit an all-time all low point uh, when about 2012, Bill C-38 came along and we got rid of, well, we watered down legislation. One of the bigger killers, I think, in, in, or one of the better ways to muzzle the public and everyone else was the destruction of the CEA registry where you have to register all the projects and the public can see what's being built, where it's being built, and hopefully get a chance to write a letter or, or raise hell or whatever, whether it's an Enbridge pipeline or a bridge across a river. And in BC, the SIA registry was destroyed. We went from 495 SIA-led reviews in British Columbia to three. 
So uh, you had information on 495 industrial projects that could harm the environment. When Harper was through on June 29th, 2012, you had three projects that could get information on, on them. And the, the, the real problem is you bored and destroyed the scientists and muscled them. Uh, they probably won't have a chance to look at uh, 392 of those, or 492 of those projects anymore. They're considered uh, as having more or less immunity from Canadian environmental law. The backlash, and this has been mentioned, the backlash has been good, and I don't think Harker planned on that. He's gone so far overboard, desperate civil servants have decided to leak more material, and this concrete uh, monolithic structure in Ottawa is a bit more of a sieve. Being a fisheries biologist, I say it's probably more like a net with big holes in it, and it's to keep the civil servants in and the public out. In my 43 years in this business, uh, dissidents, ingos, whistleblowers are now are closer in a partnership with the press and always believed uh, civil servants should work with the press and I used to get roasted and I have scars all over me from dealing with the press that was considered a no-no in government even back in 1969, 1970 but now there's a quite I'd say a working partnership and, uh, and uh, there's also a, a, a refinement of how you leak material you, know, you just don't go to the press of your civil servant unless you want your head lopped off and to some degree, I'd say we've created the laundered leak. And uh, when I released Bill C-38, I didn't get it from the Prime Minister or the Minister of Fisheries. I got it from some unknown source who wouldn't dare leak it because their job would be on the line. I get the material and I didn't leak it really, I just released it. But it, it's important to launder your leaks and I probably uh, was probably one of the pioneers of that in the 70s and 80s and it was quite a difficult life to live really. Your, your job was always on the line. The press is really important in all of this. They are really still our guard, guardian of democracy. And just a little story here, and I'm almost done, uh, is that about two months ago, DFO staff decided to have their own consultations on how to change the organization. And a bunch of NGOs uh, were going to be co-opted, and they were going to sit on these meetings and that. And I told them, I said, don't bloody well do that. There's a Cohen inquiry. Uh, why is DFO starting their own consultations? They're trying to undermine the Cohen inquiry and they're trying to look proactive. And I said, that's a bullshit approach. Don't play their game. And uh, we never had an agreement. I boycotted all of those, uh, uh, those meetings. And uh, then a senior reporter back east uh, saw my memo and he said, don't boycott these meetings, he says. You guys, whether the meetings are irrelevant or not, go to them because you're now our only source of information from the Harper government. And uh, I didn't go to the meetings, but I appreciated his point of view. And then he said to me, and don't you ever use my name because I shouldn't be, in, be seen as being in bed with you. So I guess I've been muzzled by the press now. <laughs> Muzzling the scientists and the government staff in summary. It's a relatively new profession, science really. And uh, scientists are some of the people that cause the most embarrassment to a blind, non-scientific, non ideological position, especially that many of them that we see coming from the Harper government right now. It's easy to muzzle a scientist. Uh, you, do, you don't let them publish. You block their publishing. You delay their publications. You can threaten and bully them. You can cut their, their, their resources, their budget. And then you can even fire them. And scientists have lost their jobs. And it's just not Harper. I remember I worked with environment scientist uh, who uh, was a sessional professor at U Victoria and she was hired under the Mulroney, fired under the Mulroney Green Plan when information got out and it was traced to her. So uh, firings aren't anything new really. That's one of the few things you can do in government to get fired. You can be inept, you can be dead, well, you can be incompetent and you'll probably get a promotion but if you leak something you're gonna get fired. Uh, the, thank God we're a civilized society. Beheadings aren't allowed at this time. Muzzling the public, the public has no information, ATIP is used to control, we destroy registries, we effectively muzzle the public, uh, they don't know really what's going on. Muzzling the press, well the scientists are muzzled, the public's muzzled, they're getting no data, they can't look at the registries on CIA and things like that. Uh, they no longer have press conferences. Uh, recent uh, same reporter back east told me that uh, under Bill C-38, Minister Ashfield didn't have a single press conference throughout that controversy, except one, uh, just before uh, they voted on the bill, he had a press conference in Chalk River, an hour or more north of Ottawa. I don't know why he would go to Chalk River. I guess it was the, the quickest he could get away from Ottawa and call a press conference, and they forgot to invite the press. 
And they said it was a minor oversight. <laughs> then, of course, muzzle the opposition. And what government has better done than at Harper? You suspend Parliament, no press conferences, no accountable legislation uh, is the rule of the present uh, new legislation that we see coming about. And I think what's happening now in Canada should worry all Canadians. Harper is honing a proactive muzzling of all information and voices of opposition and a possible embarrassment. We're losing our transparency in government. We're losing consultation. Government doesn't even know how to consult anymore. Uh, we're uh, we're uh, uh, getting rid of any proactive media information. And, uh, and uh, we're pretty well stifling the release of all technical information. That totally undermines democracy, and Canadians should be worried. However, you can say, is it any different industry, non-profit societies, or political parties? Of course it's not. Uh, the real issue is where do you draw the line? I think the civil servants do serve the public interest. You pay for them. And, uh, or, or are they just there to make the government look good? Uh, I, I think most senior level bureaucrats are convinced that civil servants are there to make the government look good. We know the politicians think that, and that's got to be changed. And uh, one final comment, whistleblower, whistleblower protection will achieve little to re re uh, restore that transparency. And we, muzzling is in our nature, whether we like it or not. Uh, I call it undemocratic conflict resolution, the bully rules. Thanks. Well, you're right, that wasn't a positive uh, end point, but... Uh, I'm a railer. <laughs> that's fine. Um, thank you for that, and uh, I'd say if muzzling is in our nature, uh, one of the things that may also be in our nature is to criticize and speak out against that. And I think your example uh, is really a positive one that way, and I think um, it's really inspirational for people who are actually uh, in those positions and who are thinking about, well, what, what, what choices do I have? What, what role should I play? So I want to thank you anyways for that uh, role that I think you play in terms of inspiring uh, that kind of communication. Because there's a force and a credibility that comes from people who have been in the situation uh, to speak about these kinds of issues that those of us outside don't necessarily have. So thank you uh, for that. Uh, the final uh, speaker today is Isabel Cote a professor of marine ecology in the Department of Biological Sciences at SFU. Uh, she's a leading global scholar in this area, having published over 120 scientific papers on a variety of topics in marine ecology and conservation. Now, in addition to this really impressive record as a scientific researcher and a teacher, she's also been a strong, strong public advocate for environmental regulation, and together with two of her colleagues, uh, she recently published a letter in the journal Science, which criticized uh, the Harper government's revisions to the Fisheries Act. Isabel. Okay, well, um, I'd like to thank MDD for inviting me, uh, even though I'm completely petrified because I must admit I'm really at the edge of my comfort zone here. This is not the kind of thing I usually talk about. I'm just an academic. Um, but science, I think, is important in democratic countries. And this is shown um, in words and actions of um, many heads of state. Um, I'm going to use slides because that's what I normally do. There you go. Barack Obama, uh, when he started his first term, and hopefully he'll have a second one. Um, said science and the scientific process must inform and guide decisions of my administration on a wide range of issues including improvement of public health, protection of the environment, increased efficiency of energy use, mitigation of the threat of climate change, and protection of national security. And he proceeded to appoint some of his country's finest scientists to positions of influence. Now, just on Wednesday this week, Julia Gillard, the Prime Minister of Australia, unveiled the winners of this year's Prime Minister's Prizes for Science. And in her speech, she said that reason and scientific inquiry are values that underpin a civilized society. And Australia, with the help of a whole slew of 
absolutely amazing marine scientist, is leading the world today in marine conservation. In Canada, we don't even have a chief scientific advisor to the government. Now, science is important to me. Um, I'm an academic scientist. I live in a place like that. Um, but my right to pursue the research that I want, to have it published where I want, and to present it to whichever audience I choose to, are at the heart of the concept of academic freedom. I think it would be very difficult for the government to muzzle somebody like me. This, these may be famous last words. <laughs> but right now, it would be difficult for them to do it. Um, I think I'm unlikely ever to experience the kind of um, pressures and limitations of freedom that my colleagues in government have been experiencing over the past few years. But I am in a very good position, I think, um, to understand what it does to the science that they produce. Now, as a scientist, the main outlet for my work and the yardstick by which my success is measured is through the publication uh, of my work in scientific journals. Now, my work is reviewed by expert peers, and if they deem it original and if they deem it sound, it's going to be accepted for publication in places like this. Now, these particular outlets reach very few people, it must be said. However, I can reach a whole lot more people if I go to conferences and I speak to scientific audiences. And I can reach even more people if I manage to get a journalist interested in my discoveries, like what happened um, this summer when we wrote that paper in science. Now, speaking personally with journalists is often crucial because it's the only way that a scientist can make sure that the take-home message from their scientific paper is relayed accurately. Okay. Now, these two activities here, going to conferences and speaking freely to the media, are two activities that the current government has effectively curtailed for their own scientists and especially for those who do work that, challenge, that challenges current policies. Okay. Now, science is not important to me simply because I'm a scientist. Um, it's important to, important to me because I'm a Canadian citizen. I happen to think that we live in the world's most beautiful country. Um, it's wild, it's vast, it's breathtaking um, for everything that it offers on land. But as far as I'm concerned, because I'm a marine biologist, for also everything it offers underwater. Um, so as a Canadian citizen, I want to know if the decisions that our current government is making are going to affect these natural values that I hold very dear. And this is where my scientific training kicks in. Um, much to my parents' chagrin, I spent about 12 years in university, which as far as they were concerned was much too long. Given the fact that I still can't diagnose their illnesses, I can't do their taxes, and I can't fix their car. Okay? But what I can do, and I think I do it pretty well, is to evaluate scientific evidence. And I can decide on scientific grounds whether a government action or a government policy is likely to have the effect that it says it's going to have. But for me to be able to do this, I need access to the evidence. I need the full and unbiased evidence. And when the government starts dictating which bits of science can be released to the public and which bits cannot, well, that's a real problem because it completely hampers the objective judgment that scientifically, scientifically minded citizens um, normally use to assess issues. Now, admittedly, and I, I'm not planning on offending anybody here, but most people are not trained the way I am. Okay? It, it doesn't make me better, it just makes me different. I would say that Canadians in general, uh, despite the fact that we have great literacy rate, we had, have great numeracy rates, are perhaps at best science naive and perhaps at worst science phobic. Okay? Um, 
But the one thing we are, though, is quite science trusting. And I'm going to show you here a very scientific poll that was done this year by Reader's Digest <laughs> that shows the top seven most trusted professions in Canada. And you can see that five of the top seven are professions that are completely grounded in science. Okay? Now, just for the sake of completedness, I'm also going to show you the seven least trusted professions. <laughs> And you can see that politicians are there. Okay, It's a good thing journalists are not on that list. Um, so I would argue that it's particularly important to provide unbiased distillation of scientific information for science-naive but science-trusting people. Okay. And who can distill scientific information and make it broadly accessible to the public well, media people, of course. Now, scientists are told again and again and again that we are poor communicators. And I will concede that journalists have a knack for creating engaging stories out of the scientific findings that people like me produce. However, journalists also insist on presenting balanced stories. This often means giving equal time to opposing opinions, even though the weight of scientific evidence might be clearly in favor of one opinion and against another. Now, I think that the media should not expect the average person to be able to decide which opinion is most likely to be true if the reporting doesn't reflect the weight of evidence. Now, if the government limits access to its scientists, who often work on issues that are really critical to Canadians, and as Otto said, with data that are not available to non-government scientists, then this limits the ability of the media to fairly represent their work. And the ability, as a result, of the Canadian public to assess the likely impacts of these findings on their own lives. Now, perhaps, perhaps even more pernicious is the fact that keeping the public in relative ignorance means the end of public debate on issues of importance. Now, there's a very clear relationship between scientific research, public debate, and policy. As it happens, graduate students of mine, along with other grads from other labs at SFU, published a paper just this month on this very issue. And they discovered that the road to conservation success often follows a path like this, where it starts with research in red here on an emerging ecological problem, which is then followed by um, the media making the public aware of the issue, and then governments in response to this making, devising or revising uh, policies to tackle the issue. This is the pathway that describes, for example, um, the events that surrounded the discovery of the problems of acid rain and eventually the near resolution of that problem around the world. So I'd like to conclude by simply saying that the government, what the, cur the government is currently doing is effectively breaking this pathway here. It's breaking it right here. And this is an important link in the pathway to sound environmental policy. And the government is actually replacing this link by an e ideology-driven agenda. And I think this isn't something that should be tolerated when we live in a democratic society. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm glad we were able to coax you out of that ivory tower because uh, if scientists are poor communicators, you certainly haven't shown that there. I thought that was wonderful. Um, very eloquent uh, and made a lot of really important points. Given that we are running a little bit over time, I thought we would go right to the questions uh, and discussion. So if anybody has a question uh, that they would like to pose to our panelists, I'll invite them to come up and use that microphone. Maybe while people are doing that, 
uh, I will just invite the panelists if they have any comments or thoughts that occurred to them as they were listening to their fellow presenters, if they wanted to make any sort of final statement. I know when I'm often sitting in these situations, you think of things as other people are talking that you'd like to make a comment on. So does any of you have any comment or thought on? Well, I'd make one comment, and I, I had to cut some points out of my presentation. I was too long. Uh, is that muzzling is actually a, it's a contagious disease, and I used to see that in government, and uh, you're encouraged to lock up your filing cabinet so not even other staff can see it. And if you go into the new Environment Canada or DFO building on Burrard and Hastings, uh, you've got to have a pass to get into the doorway of only your work area. You can't go to a work area of another person. The security's gone to that level. You can't get past the base where public aren't allowed. and. Uh, uh, everything's under lock and key and I was someone called me well the fellow called me at the DFO pariah called me last week and he says you wouldn't believe the lockdown that's taking place no one's allowed to leave documents in their desk anymore they have to be put in locked cabinets for the night so if you want to get into one of these buildings and see what was on a Xerox machine or see what was on a desk it'll never happen anymore I, I wanted to make one comment. Um, I don't know if this is working. Yep. Uh, uh, based on Emma, what you were saying, because I, I think that there, one there one thing that's important to remember is that the, in terms of the positive addressing this, is that what what the government is trying to do right now is is to is to limit choice. Right is to make the you know even the ethical oil frame is to say well it's either our oil or it's oil from countries where women can't vote you know it's but that's not the choice that we have right the government has cut funding to renewable energy it has cut funding for energy efficiency programs they are trying to make it appear as though this is our only choice for our economy and for our for our energy systems. And it, it, it's simply not true. In fact, the government, inside the government, there have been reports about other economies, like in Norway, where they're, um, you know, they've, they've saved half a trillion dollars um, while from increased royalties while producing 40% less oil than we have. And then they're using that half a trillion dollars to create a low carbon economy to, to um, affect the transition. We can move to electrification of vehicles, to better transit systems, and reduce our demand for oil. That's about a choice that we have about what kind of infrastructure we build in the future. And so we don't have to build pipelines in order to lead to economic development. We need to choose what kind of economic development we want and which sectors of our economy we're going to support. And so there's a choice thing that I think is really important there. And I think it's also important to remember, you know, the m most common question I get after talks like this is, you know, well, we can't do anything. They have a majority. And the fact is, no government is infallible. And they're doing a lot of these changes early in their term because they want us to forget about them two and a half years from now. And so I think our job is to make sure that there is a drumbeat and that there, we in can continually talk about what's happening and the implications of it. And I think organizations like Lead Now are doing an incredible job of that in engaging Canadians. I mean, one thing you didn't say about your radio ads is the fact that those radio ads are playing now in ridings around the uh, country because people donated, what, thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 in the last three days. The people are starting to really get engaged. And as long as we can continue, we can all continue to be engaged and get the information out, then we actually have a chance of changing things. Okay, so maybe we'll go to our uh, to the mic to our questioners, and I would just ask, uh, in the interest of time, that you keep your comments relatively brief and try and frame them in the form of a question. Yeah, definitely. Um, thanks so much. It's been a great panel. Um, my question: uh, This petrostate fascism is being funded by our tax dollars. And in the past, there have been um, different campaigns around, I think, of some of the ones in the states with regards to uh, taxpayer revolts uh, to withhold uh, portions of uh, their uh, people's taxes uh, that were going towards the weapons, missile programs, that kind of thing. I'm wondering if there's any thought of initiatives that way, just because I, I, I you know, know some of these issues are so widespread among the population and, and large. And one of the ways 
certainly I, I would think we could um, make massive change is by, you know, retention of taxes that are going towards these kinds of, uh, uh, you know, fascist policies. So I'm wondering if any groups are thinking of those kinds of campaigns, support campaigns for taxpayer uh, retention or taxpayer revolt. Um, and uh, whether or not that's a, a potential for affecting change. Um, well, it's out there now. Thank you, Doug. Um, it's, you know, it's a really interesting idea, and I haven't heard um, many organizations talking about that, but I think it's really critical because we definitely are, like if you saw in the last budget, there are choices being made, right? I mean, somehow we can afford, how much was it for the F, the, the bombers, you know? Um, you know, multi, multi million, if not billion dollars of investment in that, yet the Experimental Lakes Research Station budget was less than 10 million, which was cut, right? It's, so we're making those choices, and that's, I think that's a great and, and very interesting tactic. And, you know, again, on the oil agenda, the, you know, what a lot of Canadians don't realize is that we're subsidizing the oil industry in this country, about $1.2 billion in the last two years of subsidies and tax breaks to the oil industry. And these are literally the most profitable companies on the planet now, right? Shell made a billion dollars last month. And so, you know, those are choices that are being made about our money as well. But I think bringing it down to that would, you know, have an, bring in more kind of average Canadians. We all pay taxes. How is it, how is it being used? That's a great idea. I think part of the challenge we face is the difficulty some of us have in visualizing the kind of world that the petro states are building. There's a great documentary on Netflix called The Age of Stupid, where after the world ends, they're going back and looking at interviews right now of how we knew we were doing it. Anyway, my, my name's Tom Crean. I serve on the board of the BC Freedom of Information Privacy Association, which Alistair Roberts recently ranked as one of the top uh, government accountability organizations in the world. So we're very much part of this BC team. But one of the things we've tried to do over the years is to recognize whistleblowers. Otto, you'd said that you didn't see that it was uh, too helpful for us to increase the protection. But the honest truth in Canada, and probably in the States, is that our whistleblowers are absolutely persecuted after they go and put our public needs on the block with their careers. I, to me, finding a way to protect and honor our whistleblowers is a matter of survival. I mean, is there no thought on how we can do that? Because what these people go through is unconscionable. No, I, I totally agree with that comment. And when I said that wasn't the solution, I mean at this time with the protection they have because they suffer and they're out of a job. And we all suffer because they're out of government. They no longer have the information to whistleblow again. And I'd say probably whistleblowers have to, as I mentioned, uh, you've got to learn how to launder leaks. And you can, be a whistle, you can be a whistleblower for a lot long. I survived for 32 years sort of doing that. But if you're silly enough to get up the microphone and uh, you're not going to last long and you're going to have a hard time getting another job almost with anyone. So whistleblowers have to learn a lot. But yeah, we've got to protect them. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. I do research on what grandparents teach grandchildren, and I must say that a lot of grandchildren are using some of the information you are giving out to, to help uh, grandparents improve their sensitivity and, and enjoy the beauty of Mother Earth. So I think thank you for doing that. But my question is, in terms of science, I do a lot of health promotion, and we are having lots of problems with the amount of the quality of food eaten and the and it's the, the lot of science is changing all the time in terms of what people should eat. But also, there's a lot of contradiction in terms of the way people would say, save paper, save trees, and then they're drinking Coca-Cola or some other junk food. So you, you find a bit of a problem on that. But I think science has done a good job in terms of preventing smoking, for example. And I hope the SFU saves the, the, the pond the fish pond because a lot of grandparents enjoy going with their grandchildren to see the beauty of the sea. Thank you. Okay, so we have just a couple of minutes left. We have two, uh, maybe I'll ask, or three, maybe I'll ask you each to make your comment or question, and again, to keep it brief, and then we'll close with the thoughts of the panel on those three comments and questions. Yeah, just two minutes of your time. 
Uh, I'd like to thank all the uh, courage and of all the speakers and everybody that's uh, put the, together this, this event. My name is Joe Fort, Safe Access Now Canada. Uh, I'm writing uh, the ethical policies on uh, that surround the natural medicine and uh, the practice of uh, uh, natural medicine, the integration of cannabis treatment in the clinical medicine. And uh, some things I've noticed uh, is that you have political enforcement but no law enforcement in this country. And that concerns me a great deal when you got war criminals like George Bush coming into this country and us failing to arrest him. Uh, you have election uh, fraud uh, by uh, organized crime that's not being enforced. And uh, there's many, many frauds going on within the government that are not being Okay, just once again, just in, in the interest of time, if I can get you to just move uh, to your question or comment. Yeah. Last um, comment, that would be well, great. Well, the question was when you have uh, some going on like this pipeline being put through here, it's clearly violating a lot of laws as well as the, the science that we all know and love so well. And uh, what could be done to uphold the laws and put a stop to this uh, pipeline and uh, because I would not like to see uh, our natural resources or our people become a sacrifice zone. So the question would be, what can we do uh, in the interest of justice to put a stop to this? Okay, thank, thank you. you for your time. Thank you. So we'll hear from the next questioner. Okay, I wasn't sure if they were going to respond. No, we'll hear, I think, from, okay. from you and then the person behind you, and then we'll close with their All right, comments. so I'll preface this by saying I used to be a biologist. I am still a biologist, but I used to work for government. But I used to work for the provincial government. And the reason I left was that I could no longer sign my own letters to the public. I was told that everything had to go through public affairs, and it had to be vetted. And my job was all about working with local decision makers around good conservation policy. So I was posed with a challenge and I decided to leave government. That was a huge step for me. The thing that I want to point out is that all the changes that have happened have actually affected uh, science professionals, not just within government, but throughout the whole realm of policy in this country. I have many colleagues who have now lost their ability to actually uh, find uh, viable income because of changes to the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, because of all those projects that Otto mentioned that have actually been canceled. So this is affecting everything systemically. And it's very important because that also means that as science professionals, if we can't find work, we may stop practicing, we may leave. And that is a huge drain on this country in regards to the scientific knowledge that we may lose because of that. So I have a question, and that would be, how can we actually ensure that there's better synergies between uh, scientists who work in academia, science, scientists like myself who are outside of academia that work professionally in this realm, and the public, because it is the people who are not in this room who need to get the message much more effectively, and how can we do a better job at coming together to make sure that happens? Great question. Thank you. I find a great frustration that must go through the whole community anywhere in the country where we cannot get our voice heard. That's directed at the media because most of the media seems to be right wing. If there's anything you have to say, you better direct it to one or two papers in the country because nobody else will publish it if it's left wing. And that's a great problem for aging peaceniks like me when I can't get my frustration exercise somewhere out in the public forum. If everything I have to say is suppressed as well as everybody that's working for the government and the scientists, nobody gets a voice in this country at all. And I think, I think the media ought to come out somewhere into the, the, into the forum, into the wide open spaces and get this looked after because they think it's, they are as responsible as anybody else for this, the problem we're all having. Thank you for that. Yeah, we've talked a lot about, and the panelists have focused a lot on government muzzling, but I think media muzzling is, is a, certainly an important part of that. So thoughts on, on any of those uh, comments or questions to conclude? Um, the question about uh, stopping pipelines. Um, I just want to say there's lots of incredible environmental organizations uh, in British Columbia and beyond working on them. Wilderness Committee, Tanker Free BC, Forest Ethics, Lead Now, Some of Us. Um, and really, First Nations are leading the fight against pipelines right now. They have the their rights and title or their most credible chance to stop pipelines. So um, the Yenkadene Alliance, yeah, be a good ally, get involved. Um, that's my, my suggestion. 
Yeah, I'll just add one, one thing on that, um, which is, you know, again, as we've talked about, right, knowledge is power, so arm yourself. Um, there is a great book that's coming out in nine days now um, by the Vancouver Observer, which I think is one place uh, in this country where we're seeing true um, uh, courageous journalism. Uh, the Vancouver Observer is publishing a book in nine days called Extract the Pipeline Wars, and it's the first edition which is focusing on Enbridge. The second edition will focus on Kinder Morgan, and, and I think it's, it's going to be published as an e-book. You should look out for it. There are two pipelines being proposed uh, through British Columbia. One is the Enbridge Pipeline up north, um, right through the Great Bear Rainforest to the coast. The other is the Kinder Morgan Pipeline that um, will go straight uh, through uh, Chilliwack and Burnaby. <laughs> and the tankers will come right through Vancouver. Um, the, the, that pipeline will increase tanker traffic to 300 super tankers a year uh, through uh, the Burrard Inlet. And I, I think the most important thing to do if you're in BC is, as, as Emma said, um, to engage. You can join um, Defend Our Coast, uh, which is a lot of British Columbians coming together, um, and um, you can join that online. I also think Dogwood Initiative is doing incredible work in British Columbia in really engaging um, citizens and helping people figure out how you what you can do besides clicking here or sending a check how, how you can engage um, every day in your own community so I think that's that's really important thank you I'd say there's probably a third pipeline and it's right in our midst here it's uh, uh, Vancouver International Airport Fuel Facil Facilities Corporation they plan uh, over the next 30 years to bring a, uh, a Panamax tanker of highly volatile explosive jet fuel from Singapore, China, uh, up the Fraser River over the Diaz Tunnel. The tunnel is so shallow, they can only load the ship 80% full, and if it goes over the tunnel at low tide, it'll hit the tunnel, and that's to, uh, to fuel our uh, habit of flying too much. And uh, I think that project is right in our backyard, right in the mother load of salmon in British Columbia. People have to get involved in that third pipeline and, and, and tanker proposal. And Isabel, any thoughts? Um, I'll just say one thing about the second question, the um, getting scientists involved and scientists talking to the media. Um, I think it, it's possibly too late for my generation, but I have an army of graduate students who are fantastic scientists and they have no fear of speaking in public and hear, being heard. So I put a lot of faith into the next generation of scientists that's coming through universities. Great. Okay. Um, will you please join me in thanking uh, our panel for a wonderful conversation. And I'll invite you to stick around. Uh, there's another panel starting in 10 minutes. I think it's decolonizing media. I don't have a program in front of me, but I believe they're starting in here in 10 minutes. So thank you.